your clear blue skies and drinking water streams I miss your mountains I miss your sunrise and your watercolor scenes Ooh, Alaska I'm coming home oh, I'm coming home For six years, Jay Hammond and his crew have journeyed across Alaska down the trail, they met over 68 unique Alaskans doing unusual, uplifting, often courageous things in a land they trade for no other. As a pilot, commercial fisherman, writer, homesteader, and former governor, Jay's life mirrors the character and spirit of those Alaskans who have carved out a life to their own design. Alaskam is proud to have sponsored the Jay Hammond's Alaska series, an enduring tribute to the grandeur of Alaska's land and the warmth of its people. Join us for a celebration of the wonderful people who call Alaska home. Alaska, I'm coming home. Some 80 miles southwest of McGrath, we drop down over Camelback Mountain into the headwaters of Otter Creek, a tributary of the Iditarod River. An historic mining district as rich in romance from the past as it is in mineral resources, such as the million and a half ounces of gold it has produced to date. Christmas Day, 1908. Prospector John Beaton unwraps a surprise package when he dips his gold pan into the waters of Otter Creek some 11 miles east of Iditarod. Gleam from the nuggets he finds lures thousands to stampede up the trail behind him and leads to the founding of Flat. Though almost a ghost town today, as one walks its now willow choke pathways, Shades of the 2,500 souls who once lived here seem to flit just around the next corner or flutter a curtain behind a cracked pane of glass. The sights and sounds of its heydays have been replaced with beauty, peace, and a rich sense of history. We didn't have radio, we didn't have TV, we didn't have telephone, but uh, we had a lot of other things that took its place. People were content. The contentment of those who remain finds expression in community dinners where the whole town shows up, all 25 of them. Here, a warm sense of fun presides at the home of miner John Miskovich. You remember those. That was fun. This is for you, Jay, that Sherry Cutler made it. Oh, great. Welcome, Kate. Flat isn't just out in the middle of nowhere, it's the capital of nowhere. <laughs> uh, he got the first boat in 1910 out of uh, Seattle to St. Michael and then up the Iditarod, or up the Yukon and Noka and Iditarod River to Iditarod. So, he came as soon as the announcement in Seattle uh, was made in the paper that there was a big gold rush here in Iditarod. John's father was one of the first miners to work this land. He took over claims that were left when others gave up, raised his family, and built a good life. John showed me how he now works his father's legacy. Times have changed in the prospecting business since the early days when John's father started here. Now, heavy equipment quickly does much of the work that took early prospectors endless back-breaking hours. John Miskovich and his family work gravel that has been washed through as many as four times since the early days. Daughter Sandy directs the water, while John's wife, Mary, pans the fine material. The land still provides a living for John's family, although it's both hard and expensive. 
What do you got? You got probably a million dollars worth of equipment here. That, that is correct, and that's the misconception they have of the small miner and what he contributes to the industry. He may be mom and pop and his daughter or son, two or three, mm -hmm. but he still uses a lot of fuel, a lot of parts, uh, a lot of airplane transportation, and uh, it is uh, quite an investment plus a, a, a daily cost. Mm -hmm. And so uh, one has to be very careful when he's uh, around gold that it doesn't uh, become uh, an addiction because even a little speck of gold, a little tiny speck of gold will cause people just to jump up in the air so when, a, when a piece of cornmeal won't make you do that. So it can cause brain fever. Huh? It can cause mm -hmm. brain fever and brain damage. Well, Jay, this is the world famous uh, Intelligent uh, water can I developed about 40 years ago. And uh, it's used all over the world in mining and firefighting and other industrial uses. So, John, all those long hours at the old-fashioned water cannon became a creative force. And, and that's what you can do out here. You have time to think. You, you have time to sit down and analyze. And you can't do any inventing, you can't do any improving without doing that. And, and you develop a, a sort of a, a, a technique in, in everything you do that you analyze and, and then come up with a solution and you make it and it works. Yes, 1910, uh, Flat had a population of about 2,500 people and uh, it was... Uh, you, uh, you've lived here all your life, Joe? Yes, lived here all my life. Hmm. 74 years almost. That'd be darn. Long time. Yeah. And you've seen a lot of monumental changes, huh? Yes, a lot of them. An awful lot of them. What's this, John? This was the Donner, Donnelly and Shepherd General Store at Flat, and we had everything in that store that you can imagine. Any mosquito dope? Uh, yes, we had a lot of mosquito dope, a lot of trial mosquito dope. There was one in there that's still on the shelves called the Jitterbug, <laughs> and uh, it shows a mosquito dancing the Jitterbug. and. And when people would put it on, the uh, more you put on, the more mosquitoes would More of them would dance around you. Yeah. More of them would dance around you. Yeah. So uh, well, obviously that's why it didn't sell. It's still that's on why the it's still on the shelves in there. Yeah. yeah, well, Jay, this is the first log cabin that was uh, one of the first log cabins built in flat. This was built in 1910. Hmm. What do we got here, John? Well, Jay, this is the schoolhouse that I went to school in for eight years. and. Uh, it was uh, the elementary school of Flat, and uh, our family all went to school here. There was never more than 12 children. <laughs> Seven of them were Miscoviches here, because there was four boys and three girls <laughs> in the Miscovich family. How many in your class? And there wasn't any in my class. I was alone through the full eight years of school here, and uh, I was the best student in my class, of course, during that And entire, the worst. Let's be humble. And the worst. <laughs> I'll be dark. Well, that's the building that I was born in up on Discovery on March the 7th, 1918. <laughs> and it was a stormy March day. And uh, then the building was sold later to a, a fellow that had a team of horses, and uh, he turned it into a horse barn. Open the door and uh, see inside. Where was the exact location where you first saw the light of day? Do you know <laughs> where in here? Right back in that corner there. In, by the freezer chest. Right it? by the freezer chest, <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. John, you've lived here all, all your life, and you've seen enormous changes from a flourishing town of a, more than a couple of thousand to a virtually abandoned, almost ghost town. Do you find that depressing? No, I don't. Many people do, but I don't. I, I always uh, relate to the good times we had and the good times we had in all of these buildings. And uh, they're sort of a monument to what went on here. And I don't find it depressing or remorseful, if you want to call it. Uh, in fact, I get a great deal of enjoyment riding around. And now, at night, there's no lights mm. when it all used to be lit up. Through the valley here, you see all these tailing piles and that's what the dredge made as it ate its way uh, down the valley, across the valley, and up the valley. And it was a floating processing plant. Today we're going into the winch room now. Yes, and uh, in here we have the levers that control the uh, dredge movement and also the ladder and the bucket line. And uh, uh, what you did is you worked your friction in your brake and they took care of the uh, movement of the dredge and all the functions of the cables that come from the winches down below. And uh, 
It looks wasn't. like you needed eight hands, John. <laughs> well, uh, it looks that way. It was uh, just a matter of coordination, uh, doing the right thing at the right time in the mm -hmm. right place. John, what's this, a primitive bullhorn or a dunce cap? <laughs> well, this is a, a, a bullhorn, and it was used to give instructions on the shore to the longshoremen. Okay, USOB, move that cable over to the right. <laughs> hey, I'd like to borrow that for instru instructing my camera crew here. <laughs> if you had to get it operating, how long? How long would it take? Uh, probably 24 hours. Uh, really? We could have the engine and bucket line on and uh, butt done. on. Well, you must be keeping it up then, current, huh? Anticipating the... <laughs> uh, as a gold miner, you never say that it's going to die. Pretty darn. And this, of course, is the engine room, right? Eh? Yes, this is the power unit for the whole dredge. It's a, an Enterprise marine diesel engine with 125 horsepower, turns 275 RPM, three-cylinder, and was put on the dredge in 1925, and it could be started in a couple of hours. I would like somebody to uh, take this engine and, and keep it preserved and operating and for posterity because uh, it is something that I think uh, as an antique, if you want to call it that, would be uh, wonderful to see 50 years from now or 100 mm -hmm. years from now. Mm -hmm. Goodbye, George. George? Who the heck was George? Well, George Riley was shot after he built this dredge, and many people believe his ghost is still aboard that dredge, so I say goodbye to him every time I leave. <laughs> well, he was shot where? How? About Why? a quarter of a mile up here because he owed a woodcutter some money, and the woodcutter thought he wouldn't get paid, so he shot him. <laughs> hey, they did things, uh, wage negotiations yes, a little simpler did. back then, huh? I was beginning to get a bit of gold fever That'll myself, so John let me try panning. Well, we're going to do a little panning here, and this is the old-fashioned way of doing it, which most people think gold mining is all about. Hmm. But it's a very slow way to make a living if you were to take and, and uh, try to do it this way and, uh, and, and make enough to survive on. 25 years I've been here, John, the amount of gold I'd panned, you couldn't have bought a pan. Is that a fact? <laughs> well, you're not Tried alone. Tried it a time or two, but... You're not alone, Jay. It's just a matter of doing this, with just keeping the wave action on top and then shaking it so when the gold arrives on the top, it'll go to the bottom again. Now we see, how, see whether Jay's chemistry is... Oh. Well, let's see. I don't... Ugh. Put the front end of the pan in the water and... Probably wash all your gold out into the creek, you know? No, I don't think so. Ooh, oh. what was that? Can't be. Oh, look at that. You see it? Oh, there, there, there. My God, Jay, you got something. Look at that. <laughs> look at that. God, that <laughs> <laughs> How about that? Incredible. <laughs> People will think we salted it, John. <laughs> In fact, I found out later that my scurvy crew had salted my gold pan with a fat nugget. Expected. Isn't that something? Yeah, where you least expect to see. Now that'll make me go looking for the rest <laughs> of it, Jay. You almost had me conned into thinking about coming over and prospecting, John, until I found out that a couple of rascals salted our gold pan. <laughs> well, a nugget is always a wonderful finale to anyone coming to a gold mine. And uh, I think, Jay, that that was uh, appropriate. <laughs> so, so it is terminal, too, though. It you is. think you, everybody dies with it, it hasn't. Right? <laughs> That's right. Mm -hmm. That's you never right. get over it. You never get over it, and mm -hmm. you're always looking for that next nugget.
Northwest Alaska is a place of contrast, challenge, and stark natural beauty. For thousands of years, the people who live here have met and overcome the challenges of living in this sometimes harsh, unforgiving environment. The Inupiat knew the keys to survival were subsistence skills and living in harmony with the land and each other. But with modern progress and change came new challenges threatening old traditions, values, family life, language, and sense of cultural pride. Now, a new generation of leaders has emerged. These new leaders decided to reach back into their past for solutions to present-day problems. They went to a storehouse of timeless wisdom, their elders. Our older people, they guided them down to Kotkibu mm. and let them talk about the things that they have inherited from their forefathers. They mm. recorded everything what they uh, talked to them. And out, of, out from those uh, tapes, they would put them into English. Mm -hmm. we, we had a long discussion about what kind of values do we need to instill, you know, or live, you know, to uh, become better people. Be become, you know, productive individuals, healthier, happier individuals in each of our villages, and that's when the list came about. Uh, a lot of these are, you know, human values that you practice like we do. Uh, you know, different nationalities have the same values. Mm -hmm. But what we wanted to concentrate on was what could we pu put in place to promote our cultural and traditional uh, lifestyle, mm -hmm. the Inupak lifestyle. And that was why we leaned heavily at the time on our elders and still do, you know, to uh, keep this program going. It was called the Spirit Movement. The elders chose 17 Inupiaq values, which would become the cornerstones of teaching old ways to their young people. These values are now taught in the schools and are the core of a summer camp called Sivuniavik, located 35 miles out of Kotzebue. Reggie Jewell and the son Reggie Jr. took me up river to Sivu Niavik. The planning place of Sivu means in front. So we're basically planning for the future. It's with these children in mind that we're, we're laying the foundation to try and make our future and their future uh, better. Reggie was one of the camp's first counselors. He is well known as a former champion athlete at the Eskimo Olympics and as a youth counselor in his region. and provide an opportunity for them to interact actively with elders, to do traditional cultural activities in a, in a hands-on kind of setting where they actually experience uh, the knowledge and wealth that the elders have. Oh. What kind of activity? Um, basket make, basket make, basket make, basket make, basket 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 Check in Check in Nature walk. How many of you have been to camp here before? Me. So, so a lot of you have been here before. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, be, we'll be watching you. Can I give you a hug, Jane? Oh, 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 hey, this is fun. <laughs> Eat your heart out, camera crew. <laughs> How many of you guys have done some Eskimo games? There are some of us, myself included, that that didn't get a chance to learn a lot of these things when we were small. And you can control your body with your mind. It's one thing to talk about the, the values that we want to espouse, but uh, for it to really mean something, uh, you've got to live them. Okay? And the kids watch. They watch what you're doing. And they'll more likely do what you do as opposed to do what you say. There you go. It's good. I saw the results first in myself, uh, because f in order to, for some of the stuff to really take meaning, it had to take a meaning for me, and there's some patterns and habits in my life that I had to change, especially if I was working with, with some of the kids and expected them to try and do the same thing. This is what we have heard from our forefathers, our old people in the earlier days. If you will only learn and follow what they teach. 
Your life will be happier. Your life will be safer. Knowledge of family tree. Love for children. Respect for others. Sharing. Cooperation. Hard work. Avoidance of conflict. Spirituality. Responsibility to tribe. Respect for elders. Knowledge of language. Our children, our grandchildren are forgetting. They are forgetting their own language. But we have Inupak teachers and they are doing their best to get the language back to our children. Hunter success. We only live from our land, subsisting from our land. Okay, there's people around here. Around Birds of the air, fish of the rivers, sea mammals. Just a little low. Humility. The people who are humble are well known by our people. And some of the people who love to boast are well known by our people also. So being humble will help you as you grow older. Don't try to be something when you are not. Domestic skills. Move it a little farther here, huh? This when it's half dried is uh, excellent, either boiled or baked. We call it igamachluk. You want me to soak this? Yes. When you hang them, don't try to break the back. Oh. Hang this one. This way. Uh-huh. Like that. You go yeah. that way, the, the yeah. other way, that uh -huh. way. Uh-huh, yeah. All the way oh. like that. Yes. Uh-huh, okay. you got to fix them. Okay. Like this. And don't do put them side. too close. Okay. Now you you'll remember one. next time, time if you hang fish, fish huh? Yeah. nunam angutenik supayanik agayutim inyaktaikanganik. Respect for nature. God created everything for some purpose for us to use. Everything you can see when you go out from here. And this is what we have to have respect for. Are there good berries right there? Yes, they're yeah. big and delicious. Take only the ones that you need. I'm having berries for dinner. No, we're if we six. are all too careless, someday there will be nothing left. Family rules. My younger sister, she started making baskets. She asked me if I want to make baskets, and I said, yeah. When she finished the basket, she goes sell them, and she buy groceries for us. Yeah, I like to hear that. But when my grandma made it basket, I sure like to hear that. Nice basket. Yeah. Now it finished. 
Anybody want to try and pick berries? Clearly there's a lot of berries. Not in the same place, we will have the bears can be in the same place. <laughs> Good girl. Kuwaya sulik samuna iju chicken. Human. Being happy inside. When you are happy, it shows on your face. You have a smiling face. A young person or an old person, when he is happy all the time, he is loved and respected by others. I love to see people happy, and that's really something I always wanted to see, as I love the young people uh, just as much as I love my own children. You know, we just needed a place where we could instill some pride in being who we are. Hey, yes, we're, we're different, and uh, learn about those differences and be proud of them, but also to go forward and embrace what the Western culture has to offer. That's what we're trying to promote, you know, is that we can live in two worlds with one spirit. Remember me, okay? This is all I have. Untold centuries, nature returned bountiful runs of salmon to Prince William Sound. And for generations, these fish fed a protein-hungry world. The returning salmon were met by a grateful, but sometimes too greedy, fishing fleet. By the early 70s, the huge runs had disappeared, and along with them, the livelihood of the Sound's fishermen. But one man, Armand Koenig, was determined to see salmon once again streaming into the sound. Because the choice that we saw then was either go to work for the oil companies, quit fishing, or do something about the fishing. I was for doing something about the fishing, and they told me, no, you can't do this. Uh, and you know how it is. Uh, you are the one who speaks the loudest and the most insistent of doing something. They make you the chairman of a committee, and so that's what happened to me. And so I became the chairman of a committee to investigate the feasibility of uh, private nonprofit salmon hatcheries to improve our lot here as fishermen. Armand helped unite interest groups previously more inclined to conflict than cooperation. Commercial, sports and subsistence fishermen, fish processors, business interests, and politicians all joined forces to create a unique nonprofit enterprise, the Prince William Sound Aquaculture Corporation. They work side by side to build, literally by hand, the hatcheries they hoped would bring salmon back to the sound in abundance. I have quite a few fond memories of the early days. Uh, it was almost like Wild West, uh, us, you know, going over to try to convert an old cannery into a salmon hatchery. Everybody helped, uh, voluntary work and materials, and, and we didn't have any machinery, concrete mixers or anything. But Everybody was, you know, very enthusiastic to try to, you know, get this thing off the ground. And so it was kind of a wild beginning. I, I kind of got stuck with a job, you know. I mean, I, I started in 75, and it, it's just like, uh, if you, you push like heck, uh, a heavy cart uphill, and, and then all of a sudden it goes over the top, and you try to stop it, and you are in front of it then, and trying to stop it, and it just rolls and rolls. Uh -huh. And you have to run for your life so it doesn't <laughs> you know, run you over. So that's what happened to me in the next 10 years. Uh -huh. But I think I should really say that without the help and a and, uh, whole lot of support of my wife Lillian, I could not have done what I did, not have spent the time, the effort and energy that had to be put into this program development if it wasn't for her support. Mm -hmm. So she has to take a good deal of the credit for that. Armin and Lillian saw the hatchery movement, along with their family, grow and thrive through the 80s. Sadly, Lillian passed away in 1989, but not before she'd helped Armin pass on a fishing tradition to the next generation. 
Your boy Eric still fishes with you, does he, occasionally? Or? Yeah, Eric fished uh, over the years with me. Curtis, uh, the youngest, uh, he's fishing in the Bering Sea. Uh, Freddy, he's the oldest one. He's been gilding here for many years. Pamela, uh, her husband, is a good old gill nettle. I understand your granddaughter is uh, a cool yeah. member yeah, Camille, of Camille, you know, she's 13. And, uh, of course, I named my boat after my wife and her, Lily Camille. And she fished with me last year. So it's a family Pretty much runs there. in the family, right? right? The Aquaculture Corporation has grown to four hatcheries, which returned 35 million fish in 1990. That first hatchery at Port San Juan, built by the volunteer efforts of Sound residents, now bears Armin's name. Well, let's see, it was 1977 when I was here. Yeah, the capacity then was about 15 million eggs, and today we have about 128 million. Huh. Uh, much of what you've done here, your own innovations, or are they things yeah, that you... Yeah, pretty much. This is pretty much our own design here. And it's still the best one of all the hatcheries ever built in the sound. And many people think a hatchery is a place where you raise fish and keep them there until they turn into adults. What we really are is an ocean ranch. The process starts with the adult fish coming in. They're maturing until they're ready to lay the eggs. We take the eggs and then we milk the males and we fertilize the eggs and put the eggs in the incubator. The eggs will then gradually develop into little fry and they will come out of the incubators in the wild streams and the fry will come out of the streams and go into salt water. In the hatchery, uh, our fry go into a rearing pen and we feed them there. And after we release the fry, then of course uh, those little fish you know, join uh, whatever fish swim in the ocean. The, fire coming out, you see the Prince William Sound hatcheries are pioneering enterprises, nonprofit and self-sustaining. They have set standards for efficiency and innovation worldwide. Well, Jay, this is a different box than we had last time you were here. That's a Zinger incubator. What do you call this stuff? Well, the, these are called saddle loops. They're plastic saddles. It creates a lot of inner spaces here where the fish are hiding and while they're incubating. So you and can raise more per given area than you could with either yes. gravel or astroturf. Compared huh? to the old boxes, this has about a 200% increase. 200%? 200% over the square footage used and the water used. A stack of six of those and pinks raises about 1.8 million fish. These little fellows here, that's what the size is when they come out. The fire coming out from the hatchery upstairs and they go through these little holes here and then they're counted in these electronic counters over there. There are these little guys, and they're ready to go out to sea. These are the short-term rearing pens uh, out there, and we're gonna release some fish here tonight, maybe eight million or so. Good one. Yeah. In the future, uh, seven-tenths of the world food resources have to come from the oceans to feed yeah. the world population in the future. Let the little guys go so they can go out and feed and come back as adults. Pretty funny, you work for months on end, the end's kind of anticlimactic. <laughs> but it's kind of a good feeling. invited us to return to witness nature's lavish gift of the sound during the fall pink salmon harvest. But this was to be a fishing season unlike any other. The sea was filled with fish, but almost empty of fishermen. This year, nature's gifts would be spurned by fish buyers, unwilling or unable to find a market for the millions of salmon streaming into the sound. At the Wally Nuremberg hatchery at Esther Bay, Armand and I were to join hundreds of other fishermen for the harvest. But we couldn't fish, for just as the fish had disappeared from the sound in the 70s, buyers had disappeared in the 90s. Whoever thought we'd see more fish than ever and few fishermen, huh? Yes, I never, no fishermen. I never thought I'd see this sight. Uh, I was very surprised when I came in here yesterday. Uh, usually it's all plucked up with gear here this time of the year. But the fish are here, but obviously the market isn't. How many fish do you 
estimate are in the area right now? There's uh, a lot of fish on. A million? Uh, it could be a million uh, in the district and everything together. And when we're not, not even at the peak of the run yet. We have this very strange situation. We have lots of healthy food is swimming around out here. And there's lots of people in the world who need the food. After achieving a remarkable degree of cooperation between frequently dissenting interest groups and against enormous odds, Armand Koenig and the people of Prince William Sound took some of the stuff of which dreams are made and wove it into reality. To some, however, that dream now seems to be about to unravel and be headed down Nightmare Alley. Prince William Sound is awash with fish, and despite a world crying for protein, almost no one is buying. Hey, what about these dogs? What's wrong with them? You can't sell those either? They're just about, no. They're all, uh, they're very few. I got one dark one here. You know, that one's, that one's 25 cent a pound fish. Yeah. That's just one set here. It, there's a lot of money here normally, but I'm just about to throw it away. Never saw a year like this one. Never seen nothing like this. This is ridiculous. By next week, we're going to have a big mess here. I hope they find a solution here pretty real quick before it turns into a real disaster. Well, Jay, in this situation, what would you do if you were still governor? <laughs> Boy, you know what I do? I'd ask uh, guys like you what I ought to be doing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, that's very true. We probably have some suggestions. And we did make I'm suggestions. sure you would. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think I was thinking about maybe trying to go to Whittier and get some ice and. If I can get somebody to pick them up, put them in my pickup, take them downtown, give them away, 4th Avenue or something, I don't know. <laughs> what should have been a boon to fishermen turned into a bust. Hey, right here, Mike. Thank you. Come on. You're welcome. Instead of sold, okay, fish right. were given away. What do you say? What do you say? What now, having shown they can make fish, stalwarts like Armin Koenig will face their next challenge to show they can market them. Given the dogged persistence and innovation they've shown in the past, I'm betting they find a solution. We do have to develop new product forms and actively go out and sell uh, the fish to people in the world who need the protein. And I think what happens now will uh, make everyone realize that if we want to grow, we need to change. We need to open up the markets. We need to have maybe new entrepreneurs, new companies coming in here, or old companies with new ideas and new approaches to, to not have these bottlenecks uh, underutilized and not utilize what Alaska really can produce. When you stood at the dock out the hatchery and watched all those fish jumping, what went through your mind? Two things. I'm glad they're back. And the other one, wouldn't it be horrible if nobody would use them if they would all go to waste. You stand out and see all these jumpers and see all the fish coming. Incredible back. sight. That is a very satisfying feeling and that tells you it works. You did something that Mother Nature agreed with and it works. Since I spend much of each summer fishing, it's sometimes a relief to hang up my gum boots, sluice off the bilge water, slick up for the city, and take in a few sights. Sights like those to be found here in the Anchorage Museum of History and Arts, about as far from fish scales, gurry, and guts as one can possibly get. Or so I thought. But when I spotted these paintings by artist Ray Troll, I found it hard not to get hooked all over again. For as his hind name implies, this guy's work can lure you in for closer inspection, and then with a flash of droll, sometimes dark offbeat humor, snag you is but one more of his trophies. Truants from Ray's schools of fish can be found almost anywhere, except in the water. On museum walls, t-shirts, and in the pages of his new book, Shocking Fish Tales. This is the story of a man who is not only remarkably fond of fish, but fish, and ever more fish, 
seem almost a fetish. Having a nodding acquaintance myself with that problem, I thought I'd travel to raise home port in Ketrikan to warn him of the perils and peculiarities which rub off on those who make fish an obsession. Obviously, I was much too late. Evidence of Ray's piscatorial preoccupation seemed to have infected half the town. To track down the source of this affliction, I thought the most obvious place to look was the local t-shirt emporium. Sure enough, Hi. there I found two locals who would admit to having more than a nodding acquaintance. Yeah, yeah. we know Ray. <laughs> they directed me to Ray's serious, waterfront so studio, where I found him on the dock doing, what else? Fishing. You can try over that away. I'm using a, a buzz bomb here. When did you first get fascinated with fish, Ray? I came up to uh, Ketchikan in uh, 1983. I moved up here to help my sister uh, get a fish store going, a retail fish store. And at the time, I didn't know a humpy from a hole in the ground. And uh, she, it was kind of a crash course. She left uh, about a week after I got here and said, you run the store, I'll be back in a month. Ray, what have we got here? Is this one of your fantasy fish that swims in your mind at 3 o'clock in the morning or the real thing? Well, th this, this is the real thing. This is a uh, saber-toothed salmon. <laughs> saber-toothed salmon. It's a, it's a real creature. Hmm. They were fairly common up here in the Northwest, and I just kind of stumbled across these. I, I couldn't really quite believe it when I first hmm. found out about them, and it was just too good to be true. When I called the Fish Museum, I'd read a little bit about this giant salmon of the past. Uh, when I got the paper sent to me, it was confirmed that it, the uh, scientists that unearthed the, the fish it's fairly typical of my stuff in that it's, it's kind of a mixture of uh, real and unreal. <laughs> the Fish Museum was something I discovered down at the University of Washington in Seattle. Turns out a bunch of them down there were fans of my work and uh, they sent me all these great specimens of my own, but my wife told me to get them the heck out of the house. So. <laughs> she didn't want to have a pickled ratfish at the, you know, so they're in the back room here at the studio. <laughs> Yeah, let me show you a real ratfish, okay? You got him in here I've in got this captivity, welcome, huh? welcome to the Mad Fish Laboratory here. And we got the ratfish. You want the, ah, let's see. Here he is right Whoa. here. Oh, he's a handsome devil, isn't he? It's a terrible beauty. <laughs> Actually, I had a bunch of my friends over, and this was sitting on, like, right near the dining room table, and then it was just like, it was a saved, horrible scene. Saved on the floor. Out of the house, you know. Oh. It's just a fish. So, Jay, let me try out a couple of ideas of my own here on you for you. And, uh, this one is called Rebel Without a Cod. I took a photo here of Jose the other day and uh, had him posing on his Harley. It's a big old Harley, and he got on all his leather stuff there and looked all sinister and got his goggles on. And we, we put a gaff hook in the back there and had him pose as Rebel Without a Cod. Give me a yell. I like the yell there. Rebel yell. <laughs> Okay, one, two, three, is one. Yeah, I took a lot of details of his Harley, and there he is. Ah, he's a rebel. We had fun shooting that. Fierce. Ah, kill that ring card. Death to the fish. Ah. Excellent. Shoot detail of that. Yeah, give me that yell again there. Ah. You're riding up through the waves. The fish are scattering. The wind is blowing in your face. Ah. <laughs> good, good. Ah. Okay. King Cod versus Godzilla. <laughs> the movie, the actress that King Kong was chasing Fay around Ray. was Fay Ray. Right. Well, this, this you is. You got Fay in there. There's huh? Fay Ray Troll. <laughs> Fay Ray Troll. I think it's rather refreshing that you seem to be an uninhibited soul that isn't given to repressing the artistic urge and also the possibility of uh, making a buck or two off it. I see nothing wrong with that. I think, frankly, well, if you want to... I like to have fun with it, basically. And I think that, you know, the art world can get awfully pompous and stuck up and very narrow-minded. Even though it's all about freedom of expression and doing your own thing, it's like you've got to do just the right thing. And I guess I just want to do my own thing and make a good product, have a, have a very finely crafted product um, that you believe in. And it's an art that goes right to the people, too. I guess I look at the t-shirts as being kind of uh, every man's sort of art. 
Oh, here, Ray, I got another one for you. <laughs> What's this one? Oh, you drew this one. I drew it. All right. Well, I was fish, ashamed to say it out loud. Fish scales. Uh, this is, well, this, should no, I do a full-scale illustration out of that? Full-scale illustration. Okay. Right. Well, that's good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you haven't thought of adding a new dimension to your T-shirt line, I think we mentioned, talked about it before, kind of scratch and sniff uh, <laughs> to give you a little bit more of the, wow. uh, <laughs> the flavor and aroma. <laughs> Well, you know, sometimes the uh, the T-shirts down at Silver Lining, they're right next to the uh, salmon smoker there. Mm -hmm. And literally, they, the shirts have an aroma of smoked salmon they about them. Sure That's kind of a kick. Well, Jay, if we don't get blown away here today, let's try to make it up here to the seafood shop, huh? I love Alaska. Lots of fishing here. After you. Excuse me. This is where it was all spawned here, actually, in this very store. Do they sell fish here, too? <laughs> well, sometimes. Hey, these guys look good enough to draw, Jay. They what do, do you think? They do indeed. Yeah. I think they look also good enough to eat. Look, a sculpin, sailfin sculpin. Actually, he's got it laying over there mm -hmm. in the back there. You can't quite see that, but when he brings it up, it's really neat looking. Mm -hmm. I might sketch that. If you think fish are weird, check yeah. out these guys, man. Yeah. That, that is from another planet. Yeah. Look at that. He's got little feeders. Yep. Little. Yep. Our sculpin friend looks like he's had a pretty full meal there lately. Sure he's does. got a kind of a fat belly. These sculpins have, you know, the real cool looking eyebrows. Mm. I mean, even in my wildest dreams, I them. couldn't dream up a fish like this. <laughs> oh, how about prawn shop? We just walked by. <laughs> Now, oh, okay, I think I'll, I'll put that one down. Prawn, prawn shop. shop. Or even spawn shop, I suppose, might be a... We could have a big old shrimp or something behind the counter saying, okay, I'm only going to give you 50 bucks for that. <laughs> okay? Okay. I think I'm going to have to maybe put you on the payroll or something here. <laughs> well, I didn't even stay inside the lines today. After a day in the studio sketching, researching, and smelling fish, I assumed Ray would seek respite and family life high above tidewater. Instead, I found he'd lured them off the deep end as well. What's this? Patrick, he's a year and a half old. What's this? A ish. A purple one in there. Then uh, Karina is four years old. I'm going to do a fish in a dinosaur. Yikes! Now, you want me to bring 20 each of these? Michelle really runs uh, the business side of the uh, whole troll line effort no, here. they're both 11 colors each. No, they're cool. Should we bring some? She does the accounting okay. and Bye. takes orders for uh, the posters so, and postcards. Ray. She wants to do a uh, poster on 25 by 30 sheet of paper. Here comes a little messenger for you there. Hi there. So it really is a team effort. Ish. Look at all the ish. Yeah. What do you want? You want this one? Mm. Oh, yeah. Calm him right down. This one is called Ratfish Charters. And actually, this kind of grew out of the, the radio program that I used to do. I used to have a, a Friday afternoon thing, and we were called the Rap and Ratfish Brothers. <laughs> All right, that was Country Joe and the Fish, and this is Ratfish Ray here with you. And tonight, joining me in the studio is Ratfish Russell, the Rappin' Ratfish Brothers here with you. And uh, coming up next, we got some more fish music. But hey, hey, first, let's do the weather, shall we? Tonight, rain and very windy. Southeast winds at 35 miles an hour. Saturday, rain. Sunday, Rain. Rain! That's right, the big R. Coming up next, we've got a song from The Squawking Fish. That's right, Russell and I used to be in a band a long time ago. The Squawking Fish on Big Bird Radio 105.9, Care Beauty Catch Can, Spawn Till You Die. Boom. Ever since I was a small fry, all I wanted to do is get in a stream and swim right up to you. I want you to love, baby. I want you to love. Spawn, spawn, spawn till you die, baby. Spawn, spawn, spawn till you die, yeah. We spawn, spawn, spawn till you die, yeah. Well, the 
ever since I was a small fry. Ketchikan has one of the highest rainfalls anywhere. Do you find that appealing? It, it struck me the other day when I was driving into town. Living in Ketchikan is about as close as you can come to actually living underwater. <laughs> you might almost expect to see a trout crossing the road as you drive in. Oh, I can't hear. That's right. Ray, when I first saw your exhibit and some of your work, I felt that perhaps you were a one-dimensional guy hung up solely on fish and had a little concern for your mental well-being. Well, but after you. having huh. met you, uh, I'm convinced you're hung up on fish, but oh, not man. only fish, and that's uh, important. Well, you know, it is, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a tough disease. I'm glad you, can, you understand and uh, you commiserate with me, but, you know, I think maybe you've got a little bit of of the old disease about yourself well, there, too, A little bit is rubbed tell. off, uh, I have to confess. I share your affliction to some modest extent. Well, tell you what, if you're out there on the lake, you know, rowing around or, or tooling around in your skiff there, and if you come up with any brilliant ideas, you know, just, just send them to me. All right, I'll do Call that. Call me up. I'll do that. Nice work. Oh, well, thank you very much.